Laura and uh, I serve at our local church with a wonderful team of people and so thank you for joining us today we are still in our series called right here right now where we are looking at the book of Mark and and what happened when Jesus entered people's worlds and uh, there's a multitude of stories in here of of Jesus just going to people and things drastically changing once he entered their world and we believe that he's still working today right here and right now among us and um, if you've missed the previous weeks don't worry you can follow it up on YouTube and go check it out it's been wonderful now have you ever been desperate or maybe just found yourself in a desperate situation perhaps because something was expected of you and and you were totally out of your depth and you were unable to meet the requirements Think for a moment. Think of a time when you were desperate. I remember some time ago, uh, my, Makoa, my youngest, he was probably about a, just over a year and, uh, and we were home. I was at home alone with the kids because Hans had gone out with a car and so I, was, I didn't have a car at home and he had a high fever. And uh, I didn't think much of it, but he started having a seizure, which I've never dealt with. And in hindsight, I found out that actually, you know, it's not too serious. It happens quite often. For the most part, it is fairly harmless. But in that moment, I had no clue what to do. I actually told someone the other day, it's like sometimes when these things happen, your brain switches off. And I'm thinking, do I call the ambulance? How do you call the ambulance? What's the ambulance's number? I don't know how to find this out. Like it just, my brain almost just shut down. And so, so I ended up calling my mom. I was like, mom, what am I supposed to do? And so she had to put the phone down in order to get the number. Anyway, I ended up running with this little person shaking in my arms. I ended up running to the neighbor saying, do you guys have the ambulance's number? And, and they said, no, don't worry. We, we will take you, we'll take you to the hospital and so I had to leave my daughter behind figure that out and 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 I got in the back seat of our neighbor's car um, and uh, and I remember just praying desperate prayers please Jesus please I'll do anything please just look after this boy begging pleading bargaining anything I can do of trying to remember the things about faith that I've been preaching at church all of that is going through my head but I am desperate somebody do something for this little body that is lying in my arms. And at this point he was already sort of just, he, he lost consciousness in some way and he was just lying in my arms. And I was trying not to be too crazy, wanted to tell the neighbor, I was very grateful, but drive faster, drive faster, you know, like he was taking it slow. And anyway, and we got to the hospital eventually, parked. And I remember running into the hospital and being met by a doctor who said, come, 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 let's put him here on the bed. And, and, um, and a, a swarm of nurses swarmed around him and they all knew what to do. They were all very confident and they started doing whatever they're doing. And I remember just breathing a sigh of relief and then tears started coming. But that moment of handing him over to somebody who knew what to do, somebody who was able to help him was a wonderful moment of relief in my desperation. Now he is totally fine. We spent one night in the hospital and wasn't too serious. Um, but in the moment, I was desperate. Desperation is when we reach the end of our rope, but we still have some distance to cover. It happens to all of us. It is all of us, really. Some of us just realize it and maybe some of us don't. But this, once again, is another perk of being human. Now, in Mark 5, there are a range of desperate people who were desperate for different reasons. And we're going to read the first story. It's a long one, so stick with me. But it is a crazy, wild story. Mark 5, verse 1. This is after Jesus was in the boat with the disciples. He calmed the storm. So you'll see that on the previous week. But, but this is, so they went across the lake to the region of Gerasenes. I don't know how to say that. So experts, you can uh, comment and help me out there. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs and no one could bind him anymore. Not even with a chain. 
for he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most God, high God? In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you impure spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on a nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Now you can imagine, verse 14, those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside. And the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. And the last bit, as Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him, but Jesus did not let him. He said, go to your, to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed. So Jesus, I pray that as we just look a bit deeper into your word, that you would come and that you would change something within us, God. May we fall at your feet. May something happen in Jesus' name. Amen. What a crazy story. I mean, a possessed man uh, living in a tomb. And I can guarantee you it was much crazier in real life. Uh, we are we're not able to hear the, the sound of the pigs as they ran into the water. We're not able to hear the, the sound of the man's voice as the demons spoke and, and as Jesus told him, get out. We not, we're not experiencing all those little moments. But even reading it, it's a little bit disturbing. The setting, a graveyard that was inhabited by a mad man. A possessed man with super strength who was violent and dangerous towards himself and to others. I had a little giggle when I thought of the disciples in this, in this story because they had just come from the river that there was a crazy storm. They thought they were going to die. Then Jesus said, so so, you be quiet, storm, stop. And it was it stopped and it just happened. And the disciples were in shock. And, and all of this happened just for them to land on shore to go meet with a crazy man filled with demons in a scary, eerie, graveyard type of setting. I mean, following Jesus certainly was not for the faint-hearted. But, as I said, reading this story was a bit more disturbing. It was reading about a man who behaves like an animal. He can't be reasoned with. He can't even be restrained as a last resort. He's lost his image of God, humanity, and his dignity completely. And this is the work of evil. But what is evil? How do we define it? Was this man like this because of something evil that he did, a bad thing? Or was it because of something evil or bad that somebody else did? Well, we don't know what the journey of him becoming like this was like. But we do know that evil is much bigger than the bad things we do. Evil is beyond the bad things that we're able to think up. It's the force. It's a force that rebels against God and his creation. 
And this force's ultimate goal is to steal, to kill, and to destroy the image of God in our humanity, to degrade our world back into disorder and chaos, and to eradicate anything that is good, just like God said it was in the Garden of Eden. Evil is, is senseless. Evil is illogical. Evil has no goal other than to be an adversary to God and His creation. We can't make sense of evil because it has no other purpose than to destroy, to kill, and to steal. It's simply evil. But the result of evil in humanity is that it degrades us to become less than what God created us to be. On differing levels of severity, obviously, the more evil takes over, the less human we become. The less we experience the good in life and the less we resemble what we were designed for. Now, this man in the story has been totally taken over by evil. His identity was stolen. Evil has become his identity. Even when Jesus asked him, what's your name? He answered, the, he, the demon answered instead of him. His place in community was taken. He was alone. He was isolated. He was dangerous to others. Even his, his normal instinct to just look after his own body was stolen. He was physically cutting himself, slowly self-destructing. Life was destroyed in him. He was literally living in a graveyard among the dead. No wonder Ephesians 4 verse 7 says, Do not give the devil a foothold. Don't let him in. He only has one goal. You might listen to this and think, geez, okay, that's a bit extreme. I can't exactly relate to a crazy man in a graveyard who is damaging himself, who has super strength and breaks out of change, chains. But, but here's the thing. Evil does its work in different ways. Different cultures, different issues. Different people, different issues. Different uh, life uh, styles, different issues. See, some cultures are very superstitious and more spiritual. So you might find that they're more susceptible to certain kinds of evil. This culture that the man was in, we know that it was not a Jewish culture. There was pigs involved. So, so we know that there would have been idol worship involved, things like spirits and, and stuff like that. That was a common thing in that culture. So, so this man being totally possessed by demons, as much as it was disturbing to the community, not totally surprising. But there's other cultures where maybe it seems sort of, you know, fine on top and things look fairly in order. But perhaps the cultures are simply godless and harsh. People who sell their souls for possessions. And they can live in a world of, of evil without necessarily cutting themselves and living in a graveyard. But maybe their lives are just void of good and life. And I believe that when we look as people, we look at evil and we look at this and we think, I want we need to deal with this. This is not okay. Often things happen in our world and they would say, this is not okay. This should not be happening. We want to deal with this evil. And we attempt, we attempt to deal with evil. Our world attempts to deal with senseless evil. Now, in the story, you can imagine how hectic it must be to have a man like that around your neighborhood. It said how, it speaks about how the people tried to bind him with chains, how they, they tried to keep him locked up. I don't know if they maybe were thinking, well, we'll just bring him some water and food as long as he can't bother the people, right? They tried to subdue him, but he broke out. Our world is powerless against evil. 
against sin. And every time we attempt to deal with sin and evil in our own human efforts, it will fail. And it will most likely make it worse. It'll degrade us even further. Chaining a man like an animal, that's pretty degrading, even for a madman. When we try to deal with the sin in our own lives, with the evil that we are surrounded by and, and the evil that we're up against, we fail. Ephesians 6 verse 12 says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. When we want to deal with it, we need to realize that our default solution will not work. Sin cannot deal with sin. Evil cannot deal with evil. If I steal something and someone catches me, how do I deal with my sin? My own solution would be to say, no, 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 I didn't steal it. I was just borrowing it. My solution to my sin is covering it up with more sin. Deal with stealing by lying. Or perhaps, you know, I'm a, I'm a good person or I'm, I'm a little bit of a stronger conscience. Perhaps I said I did steal something and I admit it. I deeply regret it. So I deal with it by digging a deep hole of shame and living in that hole for the rest of my life, never to return. See, I can't deal with evil. I can only multiply it. Neither one of these solutions dealt with sin or evil. See, Romans 7 speaks about this and Paul just puts it so nicely. He says, I don't understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself doesn't dwell in me. That is my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to, want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. We are powerless against evil and against sin. But get this. We read the story of Jesus getting in a boat with his disciples, telling them, let's go to the other side. They had no clue what was on the other side. Well, they maybe knew what was there, but they didn't know why. By this time, I reckon they just followed. Jesus had somewhere to be. He knew of a man who was totally trapped, totally degraded, unable to do anything for himself to get free from evil. Jesus was aware. He knew. And Jesus was the only one who could deal with this evil. And I actually love that this story includes a storm, like this obstacle, like Jesus needs to get to the other side. And we know by now that he can actually walk on water, but, but he needed to get to the other side and nothing would stop him. He was coming to that man regardless. He had somewhere to be and someone to meet and some demons to deal with. It says, when he saw Jesus from a distance, he fell on his knees in front of him. What a thought that the man that was totally possessed by demons was somehow still drawn to Jesus as if it was his last resort, as if it was finally somebody that could help him. I'm remembering the story of when I got to the hospital and finally got to reach the doctor and, and I, I could hand over my son to someone who knew what to do. Somebody who's able to help. 
I don't know how this man knew who Jesus was. I mean, the demons certainly knew. Maybe that's how we know. I don't actually exactly know how that thing works. But this man, in his desperation, he saw Jesus coming and he fell at his feet on his knees. Interesting thing is in further in Mark 5, there are two more stories of people falling at Jesus' feet. The one was the religious leader who, whose daughter was on the verge of dying. For him, falling at Jesus' feet was an act of humility and submission and desperation. An act of, you know what, I don't care who sees me. I don't care what they think of me as I'm falling at Jesus' feet. But I need you to help my daughter and I know that you're the only one who can the second story was, was of the woman who got healed. It was a woman who had who suffered um, bleeding for 12 years and nobody could help her. She was going from doctor to doctor to doctor and, and she was rejected by her community because of the speci specific disease that she had. She was ceremonially unclean and so she, was, she couldn't go anywhere close to her family. She was a Jewish woman. And although there was an upright culture, it was harsh. And there was no space for a woman like that, desperate, struggling. And when she fell at the feet of Jesus, I think she was scared of what he was going to do. I'm, I'm sure she was used to being shunned. She was used to being rejected. And so maybe she was falling at his feet for mercy. Like, I, I'm, I'm sorry that I touched it without, without permission, but, you know, wanting to explain herself as usual. But he was kind. And instead of humiliating her like everybody else, he restored her dignity and her humanity. He restored the image of God in her. I think that's why he said, who touched me? He knew, but he wanted her to be restored in public. All of these people had something in common. They were all desperate. They all knew that they needed help. And Jesus passed through their path somewhere along the way. He came to where they were, but he waited for them to respond to him. In every instance, they ran to Jesus. They came to Jesus. Can I ask you a question? Have you given up hope in yourself? Or are you still hustling? still solving things in your own way. Because I, I wonder if we're still busy finding solutions, hustling, doing things the way that we think. If Jesus might pass by your street, would you be alert enough to know that he's there and that he can help you and that, that he can be the solution to your desperate situation? And what if we miss him and instead of falling at his feet and asking for his help, we just continue living the way we always have? Perhaps my invitation to you this, today is, is this. Give up. Give up and understand that your solutions will not solve your problems. There's only one who can deal with with sin and with, with evil. There's only one who can, who can do the things that we can't. Jesus is the one who is able. He knows what you need and he is able to deal with those things. Desperation is not a bad thing. Desperation leads to surrender and surrender opens a door for God's healing and his miracles and his plan to take over our lives. I want to surrender. Can I add one little, little bit to this whole story that just makes it? You know this man, the end, Jesus said to him, sorry, you can't come with us. But he was the only one that Jesus said, go and tell all the others. Go out there and, and tell them how good God has been to you. And you know that in that region where that man was healed and set free, a flourishing church developed. 
in that area. And years later, when the church in Israel had to flee, they fled to that area. And that church was able to be a comfort and a support and a resource to them because they had been, been preparing, they've been prepared. But it all started with one man who was set free and who went and did what Jesus told him. Go and tell the people how good I've been to you. When we surrender, we become a part of God's big plan. Can I pray with you today? Perhaps you're saying, ah, you know what? I'm going to give it up. I'm going to just choose to trust Jesus. Or perhaps you're saying, I don't even know if I've got strength to run to Jesus. But you know what? He's right here, right now. And He wants to hear from us. He wants to respond to us. So let's pray. God, thank you that you see us. Thank you that you know us, you know our worlds, you know the way we think, you know the, the thought patterns that we go back to over and over and over. And you're so kind. And I'm just thinking about how you were on your way to that man and he didn't know it yet. He didn't know that everything was about to be changed, but you knew you were, uh, you were determined to get to him because you had compassion on him, but also you had a big plan for his life to play a part in your big story. So God, today we want to give ourselves to you and we want to open ourselves up to what it is that you want to do in our lives. We want to open ourselves up to you coming and changing things around completely. So God, today, would you come and meet with us? Would you come and cross our path? Would you come as we drive somewhere or as we're sitting and eating? Would you come and meet with us, Lord Jesus? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.